hopefully we'll have less of that echo or buzz or whatever we had before on messing with the speakers ever since we moved them they haven't been quite right so I'll get them figured out here um, as you can see on the screen up here I'm today I'm going to go with a concept called working out and this really came to my heart again this week and and God has led me to the verse and then work walk my way through that and I had a, I had an individual call me this early well, this week or let, yeah early this week and his father-in-law's been in a nursing home for several years, COPD, wasn't doing well, and had never been baptized, and he wanted to be baptized. And they asked me if I'd do it, and we had scheduled it for uh, yesterday morning, and he passed away in between. He passed away on, on a uh, Thursday morning at 2 o'clock, and they didn't expect that to go, you know, that it was going to be that quick. but. Um, I was really blessed by the family that asked me, and they talked to me about their dad quite a bit. And I know he was saved, but um, it was an amazing thing just to be asked that. And as I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about that individual, and I'm thinking about what about us? This man was in his, I mean, believe late 70s. What about us? Between now and that time, when we know that we're going to be going back to see Christ, when we're when when our time is over, what are we going to do in between now and then? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer here. Father, I thank you so much that we have this opportunity to to gather together and to, to uh, get into your Word. I pray, Lord, that you bless this time that you give me the words that you want spoken. I ask this in your Son's name. Amen. What if we turn that one? Try and turn that one. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that'll be better. A little bit. No, it's not echoing though, so that's good. Okay. All right. So, when you think working out, what do we think about? We normally think about gyms and all that kind of stuff, but really, this this concept that Paul brings forward here in Philippians about working out is more about growth and growing. So, when we think about growing, we think about children, right? And we expect growth. We expect growth out of our children. We accept certain behavior when they're two. We call them terrible twos and we put up with that. But when they're three, we say, you're not two anymore. And when they're 15, we say, you're not two anymore. Things keep growing. Things we're looking for, things like strength. We expect growth in strength in our children. We accept growth in, in a, our emotional strength, our emotional behavior. We expect kids to grow in that. We also expect things like finances. You're supposed to get smarter as you get older. I know we've gotten smarter, not smart, about finances, but those things are natural. We expect that kind of growth. And I think God expects the same kind of growth with us. When you accept Christ, that's just the beginning. You're a newborn baby at that point in time. That's not the end. That's the beginning. So if we are, uh, if we are believers, then... What do we do between that beginning and the end? That's what I want to talk about today. This next picture here, I don't know if anybody remembers these, but I think my mom collected the little dolls, the little yeah. precious moments dolls. Yeah. And I always remember this one, be patient, God isn't finished with me yet. And I, I, she had like a little statue or something, and they had something broken at their feet. I think this is what it was, like a little kid saying, oh, yeah, God's not quite done with me yet. I, I think that's true. I think there is, there is growth that we can have throughout our walk with Christ. But that's not an optional growth. That's a necessary growth. So let's look at our, our uh, verse here today. Philippians 2.12 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my person only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Oh boy, this is a loaded verse here. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's uh, That can be a scary thing to look at that. But we're going to go into what Paul is saying here and what he means when he says this. Sometimes, again, when we translate our, the Bible from the Aramaic or the Greek into English, we, we take these words and we kind of 
switch the meaning on it because it doesn't directly translate. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Let's talk first of all about what it doesn't mean. Well, the first thing I want to talk about that it doesn't mean is it says with fear and trembling. The word that they use for fear, if you go directly back to the Greek, means respect. With respect and trembling. In other words, understanding who God is now that you've been saved, you should be working on, on yourself because of your respect for Him. Secondly, it does not mean it's based on works. Our salvation, when it says work out your salvation, it's not saying that we have to earn it or that anything we can do can add to it. So Hebrews 9, 24-26 says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made by hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been revealed to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That is our salvation. It was done. There's one, one death caused our salvation. So when Paul's talking about working out our salvation, he's not saying that we are going to be saved by works. That's not it at all. But what he's saying is we need to work on our life after the salvation comes. After we are saved, we also have to keep working. We cannot, in any way, shape, or form, add anything to our salvation by works. We don't increase it. We don't do anything to our salvation. That is, that is done solely by Christ, only by the grace of God, once for everyone. That's it. So when he says, work out your salvation, we get this twisted idea that we need to do works to be saved, and that's not what it is. But what it is, is growth. Now, that growth has a lot of different ways of putting it together, but I want to go to this one to start with. Susie's not here. I was hoping she was going to be because she's a math teacher. When you do a math problem, what are you doing? All you do is prove that it exists, right? 2 plus 2 equals 4. If you do the math to do that, that doesn't change the outcome, that doesn't change the equation, that doesn't change the answer. You just find a way to the answer. You're working on proving the truth. And that's what our salvation is. And this working towards, towards uh, growth is doing that. We are just going back to the truth of God and proving it over and over again. John 13, 35. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We're not supposed to expect that from the world, but we are supposed to expect that from the believers of Christ. That's who we are. James 2, 14 says, What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Again, James is not saying works is going to save you, but if you are saved, you should have works. We should see actions that back up belief. Okay? And like I said before, as newborn babes in Christ, we got to learn that. That's not something that is automatic. It's not natural. The sin nature that is in me is in me. I'm saved by Christ, but the sin nature is there. I've got to fight that. And Paul talks about that constantly, about that constant battle where we have to persevere through those things. We are changed. Immediately we are saved, but we have to work on being a Christian after that. And that's what he's talking about here. So we need to work, work out how we prove these truths. How we do this to Jesus. Jesus said, they'll know you're my followers if you do these things. So what do we need to learn how to do? Well, first of all, we need to understand that this concept of working out your salvation, that word, here comes the English geek in me, is an infinitive. It's not a one-time event, ever. Working all the time. If there's no end to the working that we do in growth in Christ. That work out your salvation when he's saying it, that is an infinitive verb. That means it just goes on and on and on. We don't rest and sit down and don't do anything. You can't sit on the couch. I said it before, this is not a spectator sport we're involved in. In addition to that, sanctification comes into play here. And sanctification is the process that we go through after we're saved 
to become more and more and more like Christ. I hate to say it, but there are people that have been baptized that got nothing but a bath out of it. Because it didn't change their lives. It didn't, their lives at all, and it didn't change anything. They didn't accept the salvation. They just took a bath. If you have been saved, you should be growing and changing. People should see a difference in you. And that difference is not a one-day thing, but that difference is an everyday thing. We talked about growth in children. We want to see them act differently as they get older. Well, we're children of God. And God wants us to act differently as we get older, to mature, to grow. <clears throat> Philippians 3, 13-14 says, Brothers, I do not consider, consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying, I'm not there yet, but I'm working every single day. I keep pressing on. I keep pushing. I keep pushing myself farther and farther ahead because the time to rest is going to be when I finish the race, not in the middle of it. Nobody's going to win a marathon by taking a nap in the middle of it. These kind of things that we work on, as we work through these things, uh, we're going to go into Peter here and what Peter says about it here in a second. This is part of our growth and our maturity. Now we all know someone who is immature compared to their age by a long shot, don't we? Troy's laughing. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> we know people that have not, you know, I know some cowboys that are still boys, you know, still little boys and their behavior and their actions. That's not what God intends for us. Eventually we have to get to the point where we go from from uh, the Bible says from eating milk to eating steak. We got to get to that point where we mature and can take deeper and deeper meanings out of things and learn more. Here's what Peter says about it. He talks about it in layers, and I the highlights here are from me. Second Peter one five through ten says, "For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. In other words, to add to it, to keep growing in your faith. So supplement your faith with virtue." And your virtue with knowledge, your knowledge with self-control, your self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. There's a layer here. There's a lot in this passage. There's a lot to chew on in this passage. But he goes from one to the next. And from that one to the next one. He's showing us what growth should look like. Okay, we start with faith. When we accept Christ, faith is, is the leader there. And then from faith, it says go to virtue. Okay, change what you were before. Do something different. Follow the commandments. Follow what God wants you to do in your life. That's a step immediately after your salvation that you should be looking at. Okay, what can I physically do? That What have I been doing in sin that I shouldn't be doing? Change that. Okay? And then from there, it becomes self-control. Not only do you know what you should do, but you do it. From self-control, it says, we got knowledge. Self-control, it says, to go to steadfastness. In other words, no change. Now I'm here, and this is where I'm going to be, and this is where I'm going to live my life. From steadfastness, godliness. Reach for it. And from there, brotherly affection. And then after brotherly affection, finally we get to love. And it's interesting Peter puts it this way, because what he's telling us is without the other things, we can't get to love. To truly love the way we're supposed to love, to truly act the way we're supposed to act, when Jesus said, they'll know you by your love, to truly do all those things, we got to have the rest of this stuff too. We have to have knowledge. We have, and and it's, it's interesting, he says, um, supplement your faith, and then later on he says, for if, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, if you're not growing, you're dying. You have to be increasing in these things as part of your faith. 
And you have to intentionally do that. In Romans, Paul says this about not being conformed, but being transformed. That's quite a statement. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay, what he's saying there is your spiritual worship, your thanks to God, your praise to God should be your life. Everything in your life. He says, present your bodies. He means everything in your life. What you do, what you say, what you think. What you tell other people, how you act to other people. All of those things are inclusive here. Present all of that as your worship to God. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are meant to be doing a few things here. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. And it's one of those things that we are working towards all the time and testing uh, the will of God, understanding God's will. The more, the more mature you get, the more you understand those things. That's, there's, a, there's a syndrome that some people have with it they're called face blind. And sometimes you see that. And there's nothing quite as frustrating as dealing with someone who's face blind that is an adult. What face blind means is they don't understand the emotions on your face. They don't know when they're irritating you by the look on your face. Until they hear the words, they don't know. And sometimes it's really frustrating to be around that person. I had one young man I was working with on the powerlifting team that had that issue. And some of the other guys were like, I'm going to just blow my top at him. He just won't get out of my face. He won't stop bugging me. I said, he doesn't know that. You can give him your nasty face and he doesn't see it. You have to say, hey, dude, you got to give me some space. As people grow, we expect that to get, we get better and better at that, right? Little guys will ask questions that adults would never ask. They're blunt, sometimes to the point of rudeness. And as we get older, we, we learn to get more sensitive to those things. We get better at those things, hopefully. And this is what he's talking about here. If we're going to love, we need to be transformed by the love of Christ and not by the world. Jane and I did a couple podcasts yesterday, and one of the statistics I looked up said that in the United States, 27% actually attend church on a weekly basis. 70% claim to be Christians, 27% actually show up. Actually show up and give an hour or two to God a week. Con contrast that with the fact that at least eight hours a day, most American... Most Americans are on some sort of form of media, whether it's your phone, whether it's listening to some electronic thing, whether it's watching television, whether it's being on a computer, eight hours a day of just entertainment stuff, and we can't give an hour or two a week to God. Now, if we conform with the world, that's what's going on. The majority is not. If we want to go with the majority, we're conforming to the world. There are few. The path is narrow, Jesus says. To do that, we have to be in that minority that is strong and growing the way we should be growing. It's one thing to say you're a Christian. It's one thing to claim it. It's one thing to put a bumper sticker on your car, wear the right t-shirt, all that stuff. That's fine. But the difference between a Christian that is a Christian in the heart and a Christian that is a Christian on the surface is what you do and what you think and how you feel, what your heart is. So, 1 John 3, 16-18, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good goods and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not live in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. I love, John is, John is the love writer. He uses love a lot. He, uh, love is mentioned in all of his books, including his gospel, more than anybody else. They call it the love gospel. And he calls himself 
the one that Jesus loved. And he says, in truth, indeed and in truth, he calls us little children. I know you're growing. I know you're working on this. So let me tell you what you need to work on. And what you need to work on is putting your stuff, the, the, the knowledge that you have, into action. You know Jesus gave his life for you. Great. Are you willing to do that for someone else? Are you willing to walk in the footsteps of Christ? That's what he's telling us here. We should be seen with our feet in his tracks. He led, we're supposed to follow. If we're not following, is he our leader? Pretty simple question. Indeed and in truth, that's who we need to be. Good. Now, this is a daunting thing we're talking about. Knowledge, steadfastness, all those things on that list. Virtue, self-control, all those things. That's tough. That's tough stuff. And the world's going to tell you don't have that. Have no self-control. That's the world's idea. Right now in the United States, the millennials, okay, those are the kids who were born, they're in their 20s now, right? Born around the millennial. Uh, they're changing uh, from the 19th to the 1900s to 2000. Those millennials are dealing with inflation. I, I read a story on this the other day with credit cards. Instead of changing their behavior, they're just putting it on to interest. So instead of saying, you know what, I can't afford something because of the price of gas, I'll just charge it and won't change my life at all, but I'll just keep digging my hole deeper. You know, there's that old saying is when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And we need to be more mature than that. We need to be growing. But we're not alone in this. We are not alone in our growth. We're not alone in this process. If you're not in the Word, that's on you. But if you get into the Word, the Spirit will teach you. The Spirit will guide you. God wants us to grow and He wants to help us. Just like when we are parents and our children are growing, we want to guide them. Sometimes they don't take it. Sometimes they rebel against it. But our goal is to help our children grow. We want them to be better than we were. And we want them to learn lessons that we learned with maybe easier than we learned them. Right? That's typical. That's what we want to do. How so then would our Father in Heaven not also want to do those things for us? He gave us His Word to guide us in this life. Every one of God's commandments is given to us to make our lives better. That's why He gave them. He wants a relationship with us, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. And in that desire for that relationship, He's trying to give you the path. And He, he, he not only wrote it down, not only did He give it to Moses in the form of the Ten Commandments, not only did He show us through the Old Testament, He then sent His Son to die for us so we could have that relationship with Him. And in doing so, He allowed His Son to have a ministry on earth that we have documentation of right here in the Bible showing us exactly how we should be living our lives. So this passage that we just had about, you know, Christ gave His life for us and we should be able to lay down our lives for our brothers, that should be an obvious one to God. That's just, if, if you follow my son, aren't you doing what he did? But he's, he knows our weaknesses. He knows where we can fall. He gives us guidance here. He also presents the Holy Spirit into our lives. And through the Holy Spirit, the discernment becomes so much easier. I had someone tell me that I'm not an educated man, but here's what I got out of the Bible today, and this is what I saw. And I thought, you're as educated as you could possibly be. Letters and degrees and all that stuff after your name mean nothing to God. What means to, what is important to God is your heart and your willingness to learn. And if you are willing to learn, if you are seeking God, you will find Him. Seek, and you will find me. Knock, and the door will be opened. Well, that puts the onus on us to do the knocking. we still got to knock. You need to get into your Word daily. Search it. Dig into it. Ask God to explain it to you. I remember as a young Christian from myself, uh, Paul, when I first started reading the books of Paul, it drove me crazy. Paul uses, uses a type of Greek rhetoric called circular rhetoric. 
so he talks in circles. And when you first read it, it can be confusing. And you're not sure what's going on. And I prayed about that. I said, but I know that this is important stuff. I, obviously, he wrote an awful lot of the New Testament, but I wasn't getting it. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me, because I was looking, revealed to me how to read Paul to make it more make more sense out of it and to understand the way he's going. And some of that was researching. For me, I need to know the whys. I researched what, how he was writing and what he was talking about. He was an excellent writer and an excellent speaker, and he was good at speaking the way that they spoke then. So I need to learn how that was done. And then I went, oh, that's what he's doing. He comes back to things. He goes around in circles. He doesn't necessarily talk the way I talk. But God will show you those things and help you through those things if you try and look for it. If you're not doing your part, how can He help you? If I'm coaching somebody, if they don't do what I suggest, how can I help them? If they're not coachable, they can't go very far because they'll never change what they are. If you have a child in school that is not teachable, that refuses to listen or change or think or do anything the way they should be doing it, how do we expect any change? They're just going to do the same thing over and over and over again. And if we are living our lives and we do not want to sin, Paul talks about that. I know it's right and wrong, but the sinful nature in me still exists. I don't want to do this, but I do it. How do you fight that? You get closer to God. You spend more time in your relationship with Him than you do in your relationship with the world. You research. You see what He has available and you use the tools that He gives us. So many times we have all the things we need to, to combat the world, to combat the influences that are over us, to, to combat the old sin nature that's in us. We have all the tools. But we don't even open the toolbox. What good is it? I'm guilty of it, but you know what? A vice grips is not a hammer. Sometimes you need different tools for things. And if you insist on using one tool for everything, you're going to fail eventually. If all you ever use for a tool is a hammer, eventually everything has to become a nail, right? Because all you can do is smack it. God gives us so much more knowledge and so much more wisdom and so much, so much more that we can use to increase our maturity and to move ourselves farther into our salvation. To learn it more. To show it more. To be more of what God wants us to be. John 17, 14 through 19. This is Jesus praying for His disciples. And I want you to, to look at what He says. He's praying to God before His crucifixion saying, this, these are things He said. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus speaking to God says, They are not of this world, just like I am not of this world. Don't take them out of the world, but protect them from the world. That's what He asks from God for us. And trust me, what the Son asks the Father, the Father will give. That's not a question, right? If Jesus asks God, God's going to give it. But He says, Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Jesus did not rest in His ministry. He didn't say, I'm going to go on vacation for about six months. I'll see you later, guys. You take over for a while, I, I, I'm gone. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to go sit on the couch, you preach. He never told Peter, do you take over for me? I'm going to go sit in the back. Jesus worked as hard as He could right up until the moment of His death. God sent Him to do work, and He did the work. And He said, now I'm sending them out the same way. Protect them, be with them, teach them, share with them, that they may be sanctified, that they may grow, that they may be more and more and more 
what, he, what God intended us to be from the very beginning. Jesus says, protect them as they grow. We're meant to be growing. We're not alone. God's helping us in all these things. So just to finish it up here, acceptance of Christ is just the beginning of our walk. Okay, if you stand up and say, I believe in Christ, you get baptized, awesome. Salvation is taken care of by God. But we cannot sit down and forget about it afterwards. We can't rest afterwards. We have to be doing something. And until God, uh, we had that in that song today, it said, as long as He lends me breath, help me to be who I'm supposed to be until He, as long as He lends me breath, until your heart stops, you should be seeking God. You should be seeking to get closer to God. You should be seeking more knowledge of God. You should be seeking a better relationship with God. You should be seeking a better relationship with each other as a community, as a church, as a group here. It said, Jesus said, or the, uh, Paul said in that passage, lay down his life for, for your brothers. That means us. We take care of each other. We can't stop doing that. If we stop doing that, then are we a church? If we stop loving, are we a church? If we sit back and do nothing, are we a church? If we gossip, complain, or sit back and say, boy, those people are wrong, but don't say, let me help you not be wrong to those people, are we a church? Are we still growing? Get real. John 15, 7 through 11. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Abide in me. What does abide mean? Abide means live in me. Constantly. Make this your home. Make this your house. That's why we call a home an abode. Because we abide there. That's our home. That's the place where we're comfortable. That's a place where we're safe. That's a place that we want to be. Now Troy said, great vacation, but when it's time to come home, it's time to come home. And I know that feeling because if I'm gone somewhere, the best feeling in the world is turning down that driveway. Finally, turn it down the driveway. All the traveling in between, yeah, that's fine, that's wonderful. But I get the most peaceful feeling when I turn towards my house where I live. We are meant to abide in God in the same way. That should be where you find your comfort, where you find your rest, where you find your peace. And where you find yourself wanting to be more than any other place in the world is abiding in God. To abide in Christ, to abide in God, to live there, that is when we can keep those commandments and we can bear fruit. If we are following God and we're growing the way we're supposed to, we're supposed to be bearing fruit. We have been struggling this year mightily with our garden. Right? It's, it was a weird spring. It started late. We had frost. In June, Jane starts up a farmer's market. We got nothing from the market except pies. She has to make pies. But this morning she came in. I gave her a hard time about it. She brought me a zucchini. That long. And I said, you killed it. Just let it grow. She said, oh, there's so many of them. Then I'm going to miss this one. Finally, things are starting to pop. We're getting tomatoes. They're not ready, but they're popping. There's all those things are happening. There's growth going on. And as that growth goes on, it bears fruit. So all the stuff from start, starting to seed in the very beginning is starting to bear fruit in the other end, and that's what we wanted. Nobody plants a seed and hopes it doesn't grow. Nobody plants a seed and doesn't expect a gain from it in the end. There's not a farmer in this area that's going to put wheat in and put a kernel of wheat in and expect a kernel of wheat to grow. 
that, that little seed is supposed to multiply. Otherwise, why plant it? God is the same way with us. I saved you. I have given you my son. I have given you everything. Now go do something with it. Grow. Bear fruit. Multiply. Multiply my will and my way and my life. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be complete. Jesus says, I want to celebrate your victory. And that your victory will make you happy. I want you to be ecstatic about living the life of Christ. Because I'm going to celebrate your celebration. That's what I want. That's what Jesus wants for us. And finally, in Philippians 1.6, it says, For I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day, at the day of Jesus Christ. He is sure, beyond a doubt, Paul says, that it will be completed in the day of Christ, when Christ returns. He began the good work in you, so work on it. You're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit with you. God, is, we serve a risen Savior. We have a living God. We have all this help, all this ability. We need to do something with it. So, finally, I got a self check for you. I want you to look at these questions and answer them, answer them honestly. You don't have to say it out loud if you don't want to. But I want you to look at these things and ask yourself these questions. <coughs> Am I growing in all aspects? We had that whole list from Peter. Are you growing in those things? Anybody in here tell me that that precious moments doesn't represent them? Anybody say they're already perfect? God's finished and you're done. You're, you got all you need. Okay, then that question is, are you getting closer? Are you working towards it? Are you running your race? The second one, am I growing in knowledge of the Word of God? Knowledge. Seek the knowledge of the Word of God. He gave us so much in the Bible. More than any man can learn in one lifetime. More than you can possibly get. I know those of you that are in your Word will recognize this, but every time I go back to my Bible and I go and I look at a verse that I may have looked at a hundred times, the context of my life and the way God is right now and the way, and whatever God is putting into my mind, whatever the Spirit is leading me to, will change that verse's meaning. I'll get more depth. I'll get more layers out of it. I'll get more width out of it. And all of that comes because God has a living word here that He is talking to us. So are you listening to God? Is your knowledge growing of the Word of God? And third, am I growing intentionally? Okay, it's one thing. We got all these young people in here, which I absolutely love to see the kids in church. That's just that just makes my heart feel great. The two things about this church I love the most. It's the fact that I've got couples in this church that are regular. And the children in this church regularly. I love those two things. Two of the things that I think are missing most in this world is the education of the young and the closeness of the family. And I love that about a church, and I pray about that every single day. But the, my question here is, are you intentionally seeking to know more about God? Not accidentally, not because you showed up at church, not because it's on the radio when you're taking your drive to work. None of that stuff. I'm saying, are you seeking God because you want to seek God? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself to learn about God? To offer your body as a, as a source of worship because of what you do. Will you do that on purpose? Intentionally, not accidentally, but intentionally. And the last one on there is, am I following in the footsteps? Am I following the lead in the lead? No, that was my mistake. Am I following the lead of the Savior? Am I truly walking the path that He laid out for me? Yeah, we stumble. We step to the right or the left when we shouldn't. Yesterday when Jane and I were talking, I, I likened life to being like a minefield. If you know you're walking through a minefield, would you not watch where you're putting your feet? If you knew that the mines were there, and the path is in front of you, but there's things there that are going to blow you up, 
wouldn't you be careful where you put your foot? I would. <laughs> Trust me, I've dug mines up before. I don't want to step on one of those things. So I'm going to intentionally put every step where I want to put my feet. The world is that minefield. But Jesus laid out the path. It's a narrow path. It's not a great big wide thoroughfare. It's not a freeway that's easy to stay on. It's a narrow path that you've got to pay attention and intentionally put your feet where you want them to go. That's that running that race that Paul says. I intentionally strive forward. I forget what's behind me. I just go forward, but I'm focused on what's in front of me because that's where I want to be going. That's an intentionality there, and it is also where God, where Jesus led us. So when we are talking about working out our salvation, this is what we're talking about. What are you doing about it now? If you see these things up here, I'm not condemning anybody by putting these questions up here because when I wrote myself, I'm immediately evaluating my own life and where I need to get my feet back on the path. But that, that being said, if it means something to you, if it hits you, if somewhere in your heart you said, whoa, <laughs> I can do better at that, then do it intentionally. Intentionally get to work. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, dear Lord. I thank you that you have given us so many tools and so much beyond our salvation. Lord, salvation is enough. Salvation is, is something we could never earn or deserve, and that is enough. That is such a wonderful gift from you. But you didn't stop there. Because you love us, you didn't stop there. And you continue to provide to this day everything we need to draw closer to you and to become who you want us to be and who we want to be, Lord. No, Lord, I, I don't want to walk off that path. I don't want to let the world influence me or to push me or to pull me. I want to walk on your path, Lord, but sometimes I, I lose sight of where I'm supposed to be. I get distracted. My mind wanders. Father, just continue. I just pray that you continue to give me the grace to come back to you. Continue to give us all the grace to walk in that path. And when we walk away from it, to pull ourselves back. And intentionally walk a walk that you have led for us. You laid it all down. You've shown us everything we need. It's all right there in front of us. Lord, just give us the strength to be who we were meant to be and who we truly want to be. Fathers, we go about our week. Just protect us. I know we're getting heat this week and it's hard on animals and it's hard on people. Just protect us as we go about our week, Lord, and speak to us and help us to open our ears and hear your voice. I ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.